Hi guys, welcome back to Behind Bars. My name is Keith Larry, and today we are with Brenton Land at Madeline's, not one block from my own bar. He's a legend and a friend, and I can't wait for you guys to meet him. Come on inside. So you're born and raised in Brooklyn. What part? Yeah, uh, I was born and raised in East Flatbush, which is okay. historically a rough part. That's what I've heard. Very rough part. Um, I wouldn't know now because I haven't been back because it was so rough. I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but I think it taught me a lot of lessons and about how I wanted to get away. You know, when you grow up in a neighborhood like that, you realize you get a lot of, you get a lot of culture, you got a lot of vibes and grooves, but then you're looking around and you're like, this doesn't quite seem like it's sustainable for a long time. So, right. um, stayed in New York my whole life, took myself to college and eventually ended up doing no off. How did you end up in hospitality? Was it like on purpose or by accident? Dude, uh, a little combo of both. So the way I got into bartending in general was I was in ad sales for about eight to 10 years, maybe before. And I was I, like hosting parties in my house, entertaining people. I was going to a meeting one day and in the cab, I found a cell phone. I returned the cell phone to the owner and it was Chris Reed, um, who was working at Vig Bar, but he was working at Pegu Club. Uh, he worked at Bargoto, um, loveliest dude ever. And I returned him his phone and he's like, oh, thanks. He's like, we get you a drink. And me being a young idiot, I was like, I'll take a free drink. I'll come here. Yeah. And then started talking to him. And he was like, well, let's teach you how to bartend. Taught me, taught me. And then when he quit his Sunday shift, yeah. the staff at Vig was like, you're pretty competent. You want to do this. Do you want to just take a Sunday shift? I was like, yeah, whatever. That's wild. And I started doing that on the side. And it, it kind of snowballed out. And I was like, well, I love this. I'm thinking about leaving my career to make this switch. And all my friends told me I was crazy. So 10 years ago, I restarted my career. And... Now I'm pushing 40, but I'm a business owner. So, right on. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, how, how long were you at Big Bar? I was at Big in my life, 10 years. 10 um, years. Yeah. I, I always I love that bar. I still love this bar to this day. I still it's actively fun. help yeah. them out. Um, but I knew the limitations that Vig had no kitchen, historically a dive bar. Yeah. Um, like so, a nice dive bar. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like, it can do better. And so I kept one foot in the door there and then I hopped out. I tried to learn as much as I could, as rapidly as I could. I'm playing catch up in an industry where everyone is like a teenager starting out. Uh, so I got a job at whatever burger joint I could, whatever restaurant I could. I ended up managing uh, Island Oyster when uh, the Grand Banks group uh, at Crew launched that, which got me to manage Island, I mean, Grand Banks for a couple of weeks over the summer. Um, I worked at Mr. Paradise around when it opened. Um, doing a lot of prep and floor managing mm -hmm. there for a while. Christian was still there? And yeah, mm -hmm. like that's no Christian, Alex, Nabua. Yeah, uh, great team. All, the, the intro team of that, like, it, it's like, I look back at it like a SNL cast in his heyday, <laughs> where you look at the portrait and you're like, look at where everybody went to after. Yeah. It's like, Alex, he owns Electric Burrito now. Christian owns Easy Lover. Um, Jamie yeah. is heading up uh, Purcell Wine Bar. Um, everyone went off and did their own thing. And so I took everything I learned and I went back to Vig. I kept bringing in new things, new things. And at some point, my partner was like, he looked at the GM and was like, this guy cares, what are you doing? And he's like, gave me the rub. And uh, I was very happy to get in and <clears throat> become a bigger part of that place and become a partner. And then COVID hit. And I was like, oh yeah, this is fun. This bar, it's called Madeline's. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason for that name? And did you think about the fact that it was formerly Ramona's also, you know? Were you kind of keeping with that theme in some ways? Or is there any, any ties to it? Yeah, uh, a lot of thought went into it. Um, so it's Madeline's uh, because it's named after a little girl. Um, the little girl is one of my best friend's daughter. Uh, she is black and Irish and my business partner is Irish. And we were just like, hey, let's just call it after her. This is the easiest Great. part of this whole process. And it was, um, well, no, it wasn't because a month later um, after we got announced, a bar named Madeline's Martini opened up and we were like, shit, do we go back? Do we, it's like, no, we're doing this for her. Let's uh, charge ahead. It being in the Ramona's old space, I love this space. And it's the only place that when the broker was showing us around in different places, it was the only place that I was like, I know exactly what I would do at that place. I love the bones here. I couldn't believe it was closing. <clears throat> it was closing. And I was like, what that place needs, if it's possible, is a kitchen. Built one and in the process, we found a room that became just a lovely private room. We wanted a place where everyone could walk into any time of day and felt comfortable. Um, yeah. We wanted it to be accessible to everyone. It's kind of uh, uh, evoked through the artwork. The artwork is uh, sardine cans with 
just all walks of life hanging out in there, whether That's it's great. chill time or party time, yeah. get in here. You know, we want people to be in here. And so in the daytime, there's a lot of natural light. We want you to walk in here and go, yeah, I can just have a chill beer and hang out. At night, you're like, oh, it's sexy. I can have a date here. I can have my birthday party Absolutely. here. What kind of soiree? I'm from Brooklyn. So as a point of pride, I wanted my first place to be in Brooklyn. Second, I couldn't believe when the broker said that Ramona was on the market, like it was closing. And I was like, that's either going to be us or it's going to be a rock climbing gym or it's going to be a CVS. <laughs> and that neighborhood deserves to have a just an accessible bar. Yeah. Um, and I want to do it. I didn't think I would get the pushback that I got uh, from the community. People were like, oh, you closed Ramona. And I was like, that's not how leases work or how rent works. <laughs> I'm like, when somebody stops being yeah. in the space, another person is allowed to occupy that. I hope you don't treat your neighbors at your apartment this way. Um, but then other people, <laughs> when they came around to it, they were like, oh, no, you're actually just a nice dude. And this is your first endeavor. Yeah. Hell yeah, we support you. Like, this is great. We like what you did. Um, and so it's really good. And Greenpoint itself, man. What a community, what a neighborhood. It has transformed a lot over the years, but it also feels like a second home to me. Ramona, beloved as it is, went on to a liberal arts college, found herself, changed the name, and... You like to be busy? I, I, I think work, you know, retirement equals death, typically. Yeah. Uh, and so I've known nothing but work in my whole life. I didn't have a family growing up. And so I was like, okay, if I don't work today, I don't eat today. And that ethos kind of always has been instilled in me. It's like, why aren't you a hard worker? Yeah. Don't you want to earn your take? Uh, and so I always try to grind and, and fulfill every day of my life. When I relax, I relax hard. It, it, you know, I lead by example. So if someone sees me busting my ass, they probably will be inspired to go, shit, I should probably hustle a little more. And when I do have to come down on you, I'm like, it's because you, you clearly see you're not doing anywhere near what other people are doing. Yeah. Even the guy who is the owner is out here working the, the long shifts. Yeah. I've never asked you to do something I'm not willing to do. You know, growing up with nothing and having something now, when I do have a family myself, I don't want them to have to go through the same thing. Yeah. So I'm like, I will bust my ass now to invest in my family's future. Um, my partner is from Dublin, Ireland. He also grew up dirt poor. Separate parts of the world. I don't know how the hell we met up and how we yeah. get along so well. But I'm like, if two people from such different walks of life can get along and experience life the same way and experience the same joys. Yeah. Why can't I connect with somebody like that from Sweden, from Nigeria, actually best friends from Nigeria, um, from Australia, from Japan, and yeah. just make sure that, you know, happiness should be a universal theme. Like for your experience, so you've been kind of in a, a higher position for a long time. Like what have you seen like in terms of industry, like changes in staff, changes in behavior, type of staff, maybe, uh, and maybe how COVID relates to that, if that's not too long of a question. I mean, there, there's been a lot of changes over time. Yeah. COVID was the great equalizer, um, but it also brought some interesting things out of our industry. One being care and, and mm. health and either mental or physical health. Um, this takes a toll on you over time, as my voice is showing right now. Uh, yeah. But during COVID, <clears throat> we always felt bulletproof in this industry. Yeah. Oh, there's a recession, people drink more. Oh, people get laid off, they drink more. Get promoted, they drink more. Yeah. It was always like, you're just drinking more. And then the bottom fell out from us, where mm -hmm. it's like, oh, there's a pandemic. And we were like, oh, people will be home from work, they'll drink more. It's like, yeah, but you won't be working. We didn't have a yeah. safety net. We didn't have anywhere to turn. Um, we didn't have health insurance when the world got sick. Yeah. Um, and so I started thinking about that and trying to find new ways to provide health insurance uh, within the bar. Uh, Vig has full health insurance right now, We're working on something here. Um, thinking about ergonomic and getting older as a bartender. So for example, the tap height here, I lowered it, uh, one to hide it. So in pictures, you don't really just see an obstructive tap system sitting out. But two, when you're getting cranked on a space that's big all day, you don't want to blow out your shoulders by constantly pulling pints up here. So I had them lower it down here. So it's just Smart. like, it's an easy six shooter draw. You know, you just boom, boom, boom. It doesn't wear and tear on your shoulders. What about like, tip culture you've been in the game a long time as yeah. a vibe do you feel it's changing should there be adjustments you know some bars i mean obviously the danny meyer restaurants have moved towards this sort of no tips oddly i will <laughs> place blame in a weird place netflix all right stick with me subscription-based services are coming at everybody from every angle and so you were like yeah i'll give netflix eight dollars a month whatever it's fine 
oh, New York Times, I'll give them a couple bucks. And then you look at your bank account and you're like, shit, man, like I got these six subscriptions and they're draining my account every month. Like it's like a bing, 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 bing. Every yeah. week somebody's taking out of my pockets, I don't even know. And you start to see that more and more. Then you go to a restaurant or a bar and that person who was flashing because they didn't have every single person coming at their bank account before, now goes to a restaurant and bar and goes, maybe I'm just not gonna go as high as I used to, not need to be as flashy, because I am already getting nickel to dime every single place. It's like yeah. nothing matters to me, 20 is good. I'm also seeing that there is a pushback and a backlash in tipping culture because some places are getting a little cuckoo with their tipping suggestions or defaults. I see places that don't have the best service and, and I, no, no shade to the industry, but uh, some places just default 25%. And I'm like, you better be bringing your A game. If your default selection is 25%, One place. it was on Reddit. Somebody posted an article about an interview from the New York Post with Dirt Candy and how she was saying, you know, everyone, they don't do tips. Everyone gets a fair wage and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, that's a great article. And there was a quote from one of the servers who was like, yeah, I make $25 an hour, no matter what, every day, all those things. And everyone in the comment section was like, you see, that guy's well paid, what the hell? And I was like, none of you get that that is a person making $25 an hour in New York City. That's not good for us. Like, no. you're, you're flat wage while you think in South Florida. 200 bucks a night great. before taxes? It's, it's nuts, yeah. it's nuts. And so that is not sustainable here. Yeah. So I don't know what the solution is. I know that I've always been very happy with getting tipped. Yeah. I'm in a weird bubble right now with being an owner, I don't get tipped and I'm very miserable. Share with us a ridiculous story that you've experienced behind a bar. It can be anything. Dude, uh, two. Uh, one was years ago at Vig. A woman came in and she had mentioned she had a prosthetic leg. Uh, and I was like, okay, uh, grab a seat at the bar. What can I get for you? Yeah. And she was like, she got kind of upset. And she was like, well, just give me a whiskey and eat. And I was like, okay. Uh, and, uh, and I gave her, I was like, is everything okay? She was like, yeah, you're being a real asshole right now. I'm, like, I'm sorry, why? And she was like, you, you still haven't asked me how I got a prosthetic leg. And, and I was like, uh, I didn't think that was any of my business. Thank you. Um, I didn't think that was any of my business. You know, like, I, I feel like that was a sensitive subject to broach. I'm not gonna go invading like that. And she was like, well, I think it's pretty fucked up that you never wanted to know. I was like, I, I don't know what's going on. And she took her leg off and threw it at me. And I caught it. And a buddy of mine has like, he was like trying to record us talking. And he got the, the photo of me just catching this woman's leg and being like, what the hell? I don't know if she did, but I would have hit all the angles on a one-legged chick. Just <laughs> everywhere, around the neck, anywhere I could. Yeah, man. <laughs> the other one was actually two weeks ago, and I wrote a timestamp in my phone, because this guy was at an uh, engagement party, and they cut the cake up, and there was a bunch of cake there. He ate around the plates and forks, and he took out his credit card, and he just carved a little thing and picked up the cake with his credit card and ate it right in front of me. <laughs> I was looking at him at the bar like, I don't even want to know how many germs you got or what your life is normally like because that's already some of the nastiest shit I've ever seen. Uh, and then he proceeded to pay his tab with that same card. I was like, tap paying it, please. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Thank you so much for <laughs> yeah, coming on. Of course, on, man. man. I appreciate, appreciate you. you. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Behind Bars. Once again, I'm Keith Larry, and this is Brenton Land from Madeline's in Greenpoint. Tune in for future episodes and please like and subscribe.